Welcome to another episode of Mastermind Discussions. I'm your host, Matthew LaCroix. Today, I'm joined by returning expert, Brian Forrester, who has written numerous books on megalithic civilizations and ancient cataclysms to do something that few, if any, have ever done. We're going to catalog and map every lost civilization on the planet. So much of our history has disappeared over time and still remains somewhat of a mystery. Following the evidence trail around the world, Brian and I will be digging deep into antiquity to find answers. Brian, it's great to talk to you again. How have you been? Oh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Matt, and thanks for setting this up. Absolutely. This was really fun to put this together. I want everyone to know that I coordinated with Brian quite a while ago on this um, the show that we're about to present today, and I put together some slides to give people an understanding of what we're missing for our lost history and everything that's preceded us, these lost epics that seem to have been lumped together in this 6,000 year window of human civilizations that doesn't make sense anymore. The amount of evidence that's, that is being seen and, sh um, and shown around the world online, if you were to go look, is truly overwhelming. So Brian, before I get any further into this, just um, maybe you could update everybody on what you've been up to and some of the new things that you've been working on. Okay, well, I've, I've mainly been, uh, been making videos from uh, older footage because I haven't had the ability to travel around, as nobody can at the moment. So I've mainly been doing that and planning for upcoming tours of uh, Peru and Bolivia. We have one in June. We have one in August with uh, uh, Jimmy of Bright Insight and also Ben of Uncharted X. And then September, I'm going to Malta for the first time. October, uh, we have a tour of Egypt, again, with Junior Bright Insight. And then November, uh, one of our major tours of Peru and Bolivia. So that's, you know, that's all the stuff I'm looking forward to do. That sounds like a, a pretty full plate. That's some really great trips you have in there. And I will, of course, be on one of those as soon as I can. I can. Really looking forward to that. Um, Brian, thanks so much for taking the time to really dig into to what we're about to today. This is, to me, one of the most important shows I've ever done. And one of the most important things I think that needs to come out now to understand this, because frankly, um, I don't think that if other individuals like you and I and a few others that are digging into this, if we don't do this, it's just not going to get done. If we're not able to put together a timeline, cataloging, all of this stuff to try to truly understand when these sites existed, where they are, how they, they differ from a lot of the other sites that are, that are lumped together by modern academia as being built by the same people during the same time period, we need to finally change history. We need to change this paradigm. And it starts with presentations like this, in my opinion, by laying out the evidence around the world and finally putting it together and putting it and plotting it on a map. So today, that's what, exactly what we're going to be doing. And there's no one better in my mind of anyone in the world, Brian, who's studied me megalithic structures, visited them, done the work, worked with geologists, worked with archaeologists to really look at these sites, to look at them in a, in a, from a lens of objectively saying, well, then who, who really built this? When was it built? How does it separate it using these types of tools and technologies that it was done to create it? To change that paradigm, we need to finally plot this. And that's, that's why I'm honored to have Brian on the show today, because you really can't have, in my opinion, a better expert than yourself. Well, that's very kind of you, Matt. And I really appreciate it. And I completely agree. A number of different researchers have studied various locations on the planet, but have never put them together in a cohesive package uh, like we're, what we're going to do today. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited already for this. So let's get started, Brian, and let's break this down. Let's start, though, from the beginning. Let's, from the lens of, say, someone perhaps doesn't even know what a megalithic lost civilization is. Maybe that's just a concept to them. How do you differentiate between these types of different stone masonry, these blocks, the tools that they use to create them? Let's start from the very beginning before we get into plotting these and mapping them out. Okay, so Brian, I want to open this up to you. Go ahead and give a little bit of a higher level perspective on what separates these, these sites and this type of building from others around the world using brick and mortar. Give people that are just starting to really get, um, understand this and piece it together, help them understand why we're doing this and why it's important and what to look for. 
Okay, well, megalith simply means large stone. So um, you have some excellent examples here. Uh, you have Peru. Uh, that's actually the city of Cusco that has major constructions out, uh, out of multi-ton blocks of stone that interlock together perfectly. Then next to that, you have Japan. There are a number of sites in Japan which are very, very ancient, utilizing, again, huge blocks of stone that seem to interlock. Then the bottom of the left-hand side, I believe that's Hattusha in Turkey. It's a place probably few people have heard of, but it's a major megalithic site with very large blocks that interlock like that. Um, all of these show signs of cataclysmic damage from the past, and so they have been reconstructed by the cultures that we know of when you look, look them up, uh, up on the internet, but obviously these were done long before that time. And then on the bottom right, you have the third pyramid, that some people call Menkaura or Menkare on the Giza Plateau. And again, you can tell with the guy, which is Hugh Newman, who's leaning against it, that uh, it's comprised of huge blocks of stone that again, fit uh, very, very tightly together without any use of mortar, cement, or any kind of filler material. Absolutely. And, but for, Brian, would you say this, these are almost like out of place artifacts in a way? This shows levels of technology and how the ability to, to, to mold these and put them together and cut them, looking with knobs that stick out like the Peruvian example. But this is out of place, right? It, does, it doesn't fit together with the model that we're told in school of everything being part of the 6,000 year timeline, right? No, definitely, because, um, you know, the two classic examples are Peru uh, and Egypt. Peru, you have the Inca civilization, who were at best a Bronze Age culture. Um, so they could not have cut, moved, and shaped giant blocks like you see in the picture. The same thing with Egypt. The Egyptians didn't get iron until about the 8th century BC, and yet... Um, you know, the first, second, third, and fourth dynasties are the time periods when most of the major megalithic construction were done. And again, they had limited amounts of copper or bronze, which cannot be used to cut hard stone like we see in, in that picture, which is granite. So that, you know, the basic picture that we're seeing in all of these locations that, that we're going to be discussing is there's missing information. There's a missing historical timeline that precedes the culture's that we've been taught about. Um, and it's, it's clearly obvious based on the size and complexity of the constructions that were done that they couldn't have been done by these standard cultures that uh, we learn of in school. That's right. And to me, what makes these four pictures so important is they're almost like four different parts of the world. And yet they have components that are so similar in some cases in terms of the tools that had to been used to create them, the type of craftsmanship, the, the extremely high level of craftsmanship on them, the lack of writing. Find all of these things seem to be shared by all, all of these cultures that build these structures. And that's why we call them the lost civilizations of the world. These are those civilizations that have clear evidence to show that they were far more advanced than we were told, but more importantly, are part of a completely different time period in human history which is why we're doing this in the first place. So Brian, the next step I wanna take here, for those who are still on the fence that don't really understand, maybe they look at those stone blocks and it, okay, I don't really see anything there, right? That doesn't look special to me than the brick and mortar on the other ones. Well, there's other evidence that shows even more sophisticated levels of technology that had to have been present. Some people are arguing about Okay, those might have been been able to build with been built with these types of tools, and maybe they weren't. But this, to me, is the next step. You look at this and you say, okay, along with those megalithic blocks we just saw, cut to precision. How could a hole like this, known as like a core drill hole, how could something like this have been done with Bronze Age tools, knowing the Mohs hardness scale and the types of rock that these are, and the precision that these were built? Brian, talk about these two examples for a minute in terms of the fact that what kind of tools would have been needed to create something like this? Okay, well, the top left is Puma Punku in Bolivia. The bottom left is the Cori Cancha in Cusco. And on the right-hand side, that's actually Abu Sir, which is part of the Giza Plateau system. 
Um, and what you see are core drill holes. And experts that I know of, such as Chris Dunn, who was a master machinist, he says that whatever type of drill was involved to create these holes, because all of these are examples of very hard stone, much harder than bronze. And he said that the, the feed rate, which is the penetration rate of, uh, of the drill to enter that stone was about 500 times more efficient than uh, what we have today in terms of diamond level technology. So you measure the, um, the striations and that's what he did. He was able to go to the Petrie Museum and get a hold of uh, some of the actual cores that came out of the drills. And he was able to, to measure that the feed rate was much, much uh, more efficiently done in the distant past than we can reproduce today. That is absolutely amazing. So not only did would this have to have been done with extremely high tech and technology, but it's potentially better than what we could even create today with an industrialized, what we think of as an advanced civilization. That to me, it, it completely blows my mind to even consider that, that some components of these lost civilizations had higher technology and, and more advanced understanding than we even do today. I mean, to me, I don't think a lot of people have wrapped their heads around the significance of that, Brian, right? No, that's a very good point. And uh, recently, there have been people who have tried to replicate this kind of technology using either bronze tubes or sometimes copper tubes, and then water and also a hard grit like carborundum or whatever. And they have been able to replicate the process, but not the efficiency level. So there are a number of videos people have sent me that I've looked at, um, you know, showing people trying to do this by hand or with a very simple mechanism, um, hand powered. And they have been able to penetrate hard stone like this using a hard grit, but in no way it was, is the modern day um, attempts as efficient as what we see in the pictures that you're showing and many, many other locations as well. We see these at, uh, at Hattusha in, um, in Turkey and many different locations, but the most prolific examples of ancient tube drilling is in the area of Giza and other parts of Egypt. Yeah, and to me, even if they could manage to somehow interact with that stone and carve it in some way, they're never gonna get the level of precision like this. It, that's the whole point is, just because you can impact the, this stone at some point in some way doesn't mean you can you can create this type of um, of complex um, drill hole signature. I mean, I, can, I I would I would challenge anyone in the world to use those primitive means and show me anything they can make that would be look like this. I think it'd be impossible. Well, again, there are a number of videos showing people attempting this, and they have been able to make an impression into the hard stone with you know, simple uh, bronze tubing and very hard grit material. But you know, they spend hours and hours and hours trying to create one hole and it's in no way as efficient as what we see in the examples in these pictures. Yeah, and, and more importantly, why would they create it, right? People are forgetting the whole point of this. These exist along with other incredible megalithic structures that if we were to try to attempt to do something like Olante Tambo or um, Sasuke, Sasuke Waman or something like that, I don't, yeah, do you feel that we could even create a structure like that today? No, it, it would, it would be incredibly time consuming and expensive and there would be no point in doing it. It was the ease at which these ancient builders were able to do this kind of astonishing work that is the most perplexing. Um, Oyente Tambo is a great example with six uh, stones that weigh between 60 and 70 tons a piece. They come from a quarry across the valley on top of a mountain. Um, and in Egypt, there are hundreds of these drill holes, uh, especially at Abu Sir. Um, not as many examples in, in Peru, but... Uh, but the there. one in the Cori Cantu. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're there. And that's, that's witness that it was done. And that's what blew me away about Hattusha was I had no idea that it had a megalithic, a megalithic aspect. But when I actually went there and saw it, it's like, 
many, many acres in size. You see obvious examples of yep. ancient cataclysmic destruction and reconstruction. Yeah, and it's just, but they're also in different parts of the world. That's the part that's the most important is these cultures aren't supposed to be connected or at least influenced by the same type of knowledge and information. And yet they're creating the same types of things. They're using the same types of technologies. And to me, that shows that there's so much more to the story than we're being told. And I just want to add to something that you mentioned just now is, of course, it's it's a multitude of different reasons that 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 make that make these significant, right? It's not just the boreholes. It's not just the megalithic stuff that they put together. It's how did they move those things potentially hundreds of miles. We find travertine in Egypt that could have only come from Turkey. We're talking about over a thousand miles to move megalithic blocks in some cases, whereas even a hundred miles is unbelievably impressive for the size of these blocks. So it, it just, when the more you look at it, the more it brings up further questions, not, um, not the opposite. It doesn't, it, it's, it's to, to try to disprove that this type of work you would, if you were objective, you would, I guarantee you would end up having more questions and you would send you on a path of seeking other kinds of knowledge because the standard story we're told does not fit with these sites at all. And that brings us to why we're doing this in the first place. And really what the, the, the purpose of that is, the discussion in my mind about if these megalithic structures that we just talked about and the, the core drill holes and all of the different sites around the world the, the debate on whether or not that was built by a much, much older culture than we're told is over. It's to me, it's over. It's already been stamped out and everything's been shown from every level, every piece of every angle to look at this. And it's, it's time to move beyond this paradigm. Those, there are lost civilizations that clearly have existed around the world that have advanced technologies and understanding that we don't even have now. And clearly something terrible or multiple events occurred that seemed to have wiped them out without a trace, right, Brian? We find extensive evidence where places like the Colossi of Memnon have burning scars right along a very specific axis that's shared with other sites around the world. Exactly. And, and so we know it's time to really move beyond and, and create a paradigm that truly makes sense and follows the evidence, which means that these lost civilizations built these incredible structures all around the world. Every single place you see a star and around those stars, because I did, I couldn't just clutter with millions of stars, but anywhere that that star is in the region around it, these are lost civilizations that have very specific megalithic evidence and technology that's left behind that we can see in, in terms of what they built, not the tools, but at least in what they built in these locations around the world. And clearly something disastrous or multiple disasters came along and wiped them out. So that's where we want to set the framework for this. And what I want to do is I want to go through region by region and at least, at least mention some of these sites, wh where they are, what's significant about them. Because if we try to talk about everyone, we're never going to get around to all the world. So we're going to, I apologize to everybody that would love to just have us have an entire hour on each region, but we, but we just can't do that. So we're going to have to keep it somewhat brief, but at least lay out a bit of a foundation for where these are. So what I'm going to do, Brian, is I'm going to run through the, the list, the order of which regions we're going to go through first, and then we're going to dig right in. How does that sound? Great. Awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to start down in, towards Easter Island and then in, into South America. And we're going to move up through into Central America, Mexico. Um, and then we're going to move across the Atlantic Ocean and get into the Mediterranean area, down through uh, the Bosnian Turkey, Turkey area with, you know, down into the Middle East with Israel, um, um, Syria and Iraq and Iran. And, and we're going to move down into Africa. Um, and then move across east into the Indus Valley civilizations of India. Talk a little bit about Southeast Asia, some of the sites down there, Japan, and then we're going to end on New Zealand. So we got quite a quite a list there of regions we're going to we're going to work with and talk about. Um, and the, but the first thing I want to just mention is that, like Brian said before, some areas have very significant megalithic evidence, and then other areas it's it's a little bit harder to see. And I think the reasoning behind that is probably the types of stones they had available, the type of culture, what their focus was. I mean, just because you had a lost civilization doesn't mean they had to do the exact same aspect of focusing on megalithic structures and knobs and core drill holes. I mean, I, I think you see that in places like Iraq as a good example. 
or maybe they just didn't have access to some of those harder stones. So then the point I'm trying to make is those cultures may have been lost civilizations as well, but the evidence for them probably didn't survive because we're really talking about thousands and thousands of years of time. So um, without further ado, Brian, we're going to start here. We're going to, we're going to start way down to the Southwest with a very mysterious place called uh, Easter Island or um, Rapa Nui, as some of the, some of the locals had called it. What do we find, Brian, in, in, in Easter Island that's significant, maybe connecting to other places? Well, people are most um, aware of the large stone heads that are located there, but um, excavation started in the 1950s, showing that those that were not broken are complete bodies, and some of them were 40 feet tall. Um, and also, I was there with Dr. Robert Schock, and we found four locations which are megalithic, Thick and could not have been done by the Polynesian people. So you, uh, there are more than 950 of these giant Moai heads slash bodies, and they appear to be in two different categories. One are the ones which are about six to nine feet tall, which have flat noses, and um, they're relatively small, and they, they were the ones done by the Polynesian people. I think based on the fact that when they arrived, in this location from Polynesia 1,000 to 2,000 years ago, the giant head slash bodies were there and they were simply trying to replicate them. So what we have here, like we'll see in many different parts of the world, are two different cultures. The culture we know about, the Polynesians, but then a much, much older culture that were responsible for the megalithic works and also for these giant head slash bodies that you find there. Absolutely. And now what about specifically, there is a wall, um, an ahu that contains some extremely interesting type of stonework that wouldn't you say has reminiscent um, clues that look like something that was done in Peru or somewhere in the, the, near that region? Yeah, that location is called Vinapu. It's one of the four megalithic locations that Robert Schock and I um, studied in, in person and uh, the stonework super tight fitting without the use of mortar, uh, at least in the center. And then on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you see where repair work was done by the later Polynesian people. So um, very tight fitting work reminiscent of what we see around the Cusco area of Peru, but not necessarily done by the same ancient builders, but looking very similar. So either they went there and built those structures or they influenced those people there on how to build them. Is that, would that make sense to you? Yeah, it was clearly a much older culture that had very advanced technology of some kind. Uh, the Poly Polynesian people, until they met up with Europeans, didn't have any kind of metallurgy or metal technology whatsoever. So the hardest material they had was basalt stone, which is you know, what the island is made of. And what most of these, um, these things that we see are, are made uh, either of basalt or very hard volcanic tuff material, or later on, a much softer volcanic tuff that was shaped by the Polynesian people. Yeah, absolutely. Now, would you say that the theory that the, the last culture that was on Easter Island cut all their own trees down and led to their own demise. Would you say maybe that one of the things that could have been responsible for the loss of the trees on Easter Island was either some cataclysm or maybe a dramatic climate shift? Do you think that's maybe a more plausible explanation? Actually, from what I've read, the plausible explanation is that when the Polynesians first arrived, again, about 1,000 to 2,000 years ago, there were uh, Polynesian rats that had hidden themselves in their big canoes and once the rats were able to get onto the shoreline, they were able to uh, chew through the relatively soft uh, surface material of these giant palm trees. And over the course of hundreds of years, they basically wiped out the, um, the entire uh, population of, of big trees that did exist on the island. Most um, archeologists think that it was the Polynesians themselves who cut them all down to use as rollers to move the giant Moai figures, but I don't think that's the case at all. 
Well, clearly there's so much more to these ancient cultures and, and the reasons for what happened there than we're being told. And we just have to keep an objective mind and truly look into what the evidence shows, which of course right. would the next place that would lead to you. If you, if you look at Easter Island, it's proximity to places like Peru and you look at how the, the type of stonework is, is very similar. It, it would, sh that's a, a logical place that had influences. So Brian, why don't you first talk about Peru uh, and then talk, maybe talk about Bolivia. Okay, well, especially in the highlands of Peru around the city of Cusco, again, you have these major megalithic works that uh, we still um, can see to this very day. Uh, many of them, again, show some kind of cataclysmic activity. Some show actual scorching marks as if high heat had struck them. And the more that we study it and the more I talk to local people, they say that there was a, a very advanced civilization that existed long before the Inca arrived. When the Inca arrived about um, 1,500 years ago or, or so, maybe 1,000 years ago, they discovered this abandoned megalithic city and reconstructed it. So they used the megalithic structures as their foundations, and then they built on top and around these, uh, these places, such as Machu Picchu, which has a megalithic core, uh, Saxe Waman that has a, a monstrous wall, possibly the largest megalithic wall in the world. And then Oyente Tambo, which is about 95% Inca construction, but has massive uh, blocks at the so-called Sun Temple that weigh up to 60 to 70 tons. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's very similar in a way. Um, Oyente Tambo is very similar to way to Cusco, where... In within those structures, you have much later cultures that built them, like the Inca, like you mentioned, with more primitive brick and mortar. But then you have these incredible spots scattered throughout them, these remnants of just a, a far more advanced culture. And I think that emphasis on a more, a much older, more advanced culture disappearing, and then another culture coming later and building on top of it and intermingling their technologies and writings. This is the challenge that most people face, I believe, today, without understanding and separating who did what and when things happened and how one is more sig significant than, than the other. And I, I believe you're hard pressed to find more impressive work than in places like um, Pumapunku in Bolivia or places like Cusco or Oye Titambo. The level of craftsmanship on some of those um, structures they built there is almost beyond what we can do today, Brian. Like maybe, maybe briefly talk about the H blocks and how some um, some experts have analyzed those, and they're they're just confused about how they're even made, right? Oh yeah, well the H blocks are located at Puma Punku, which is in Bolivia. Uh, the approach, the technological approach to them, uh, is very different to what we find around Cusco. Cusco's constructions are basically made of basalt, which is a very hard stone from one quarry, which is at a minimum 55 kilometers away from Cusco. So you have multi-ton blocks that were somehow cut, uh, shaped and moved from the quarry to Cusco itself. And then at Puma Punku, you have almost perfectly straight lines, uh, the H blocks as we mentioned. And one fallacy is some people think that the H blocks are all the same. There are nine of them. Um, there's no sign that there were ever more than nine, and none of them are identical. They all have di slightly different proportions. So each one was crafted individually, not through a process of either geopolymer or some kind of mold or whatever. So that's important. And then the sister site, which is actually the same location of Tiwanaku, again, has major megalithic constructions located there, some um, some vertical stones that are in the neighborhood of 20 feet tall, at least 20, if not 40 or 50 tons. The quarry is in the nature of 55 to 60 kilometers away. So then you have the transportation problem when the only material they would have had since it's above the tree line would be making reed boats out of a local Totora reed. You'd have to make a really big boat to be able to move some of this stuff. So the, again, the standard academic explanation, thankfully, is starting to fall apart. The more that people individually go and visit these locations and see how improbable, if not impossible, it would be for the resident populations to have done this kind of workmanship. Absolutely. Um, and 
to expand on what Brian was saying a little bit further on the image we're showing in the background there, you can see the gate of the sun right there, which is located in Tiwanaku. Now, what the reason I bring that up is not only is that level of craftsmanship and those blocks just truly amazing and massive, but you have this gateway, this doorway that we're going to see similarities in examples all around the world where there seemed to be this focus on some kind of a doorway, whether or not it's a single rock structure, stone structure, or built right into an actual mountain. Um, these doorways that we are just so mysterious today, but seem to be connected to all these ancient cultures. So yet another mystery that is not fully solved that it being is um, it really being looked into. But I bring that up for another reason I want to mention is that on the top of that doorway, you have this interesting figure who's known as Tiki Viracocha. Now, Viracocha is the one that the indigenous, um, and Brian can just mention this as, as well, but he's talked to the indigenous people of that region and they state the Inca didn't, the Inca or the Tiwanaku people didn't build that. It was these the Viracocian people. So perhaps you can just mention about the Viracocians really quick. Okay, well, actually, Viracocha is the creator deity, but there were uh, ancient people that they talk about called the Viracochan or the Viracochan, who were those sent by Viracocha or Viracocha to do incredible things, to teach the arts of, and sciences to the local populations. Uh, <clears throat> another thing about the Sun Gate is that it's actually one piece of stone weighs at least 10 tons, again, comes from this quarry some 55 kilometers away. And when the Spanish first discovered the Sun Gate in the 16th century, they found it broken in half. So it's unlikely that it was done by the local population and simply fell over and broke. It's probably a sign of ancient cataclysmic activity. And also all the surface carving um, of the figures and the bird men that are carved into it were was done very crudely. So that would have been done um, on the perfect surfaces that the, the Tiwanaku culture uh, discovered when they went there, because we see no ornamentation in almost all of the megalithic constructions around the world. You simply have form and function. It just shows you that they had a completely different reason for why they did it than, than we can even really understand today. It's almost like our mentality of why we would build something like this is lost in, in terms of our understanding of what they knew about the earth and the, and the cycles of the cosmos. And we're just trying to, that's why another reason why I feel like this is so important is not only that we're expanding on these lost cultures and, and where they were, but maybe by investigating this and determining that it's significant and different than we have now and part of a lost time, we can glimmer, have a glimpse into why they made them. And then that might open up all kinds of other doors into us understanding more complicated aspects of um, technologies and what's possible in reality, I would, I would say. So Brian, let's go ahead and I'll mention Ecuador. Is, there's a site in Ecuador that contains some megalithic characteristics as well, right? Yeah, there's at least one location. It's called Inga Perca. And it's the same thing. It was an Inca construction, but you can tell that the foundation work is megalithic. And so it's another example of where the Inca found an ancient location and decided to uh, reconstruct it and turn it into a, a ritual site. The original function, we don't know, but Inca Perca is probably the most Northern example in South America of a major Inc um, megalithic construction adopted by the Inca. That's right. So obviously those borders went around back then, but that just shows you the region of where these um, places are located of significance. So let's go ahead and move further north, Brian, into, um, and I, I guess we'll start with Mexico. And we have, in Mexico, we have some very interesting locations. Uh, we have places that have some amazing, um, not in the same way, I guess, of technology and, and megalithic structures that we see in South America, but we have some other really strange sites, like, for instance, the Olmec heads and the monolith of Tlaloc. Why don't you go ahead and briefly talk about some of the some of these sites around uh, southern and central Mexico? Okay, well, the important thing about Mexico is that the, we do have evidence of megalithic construction, but not on the same scale as we find in Peru, Bolivia, and places like Egypt. But the Olmec heads are really intriguing. Some of them were made from relatively soft material, 
but others of basalt, which again is a very hard material. Most, if not all of them, were found in relatively recent times buried underground for some reason. So I think it's highly unlikely that the Olmec civilization were responsible for making them. They probably discovered them as we've seen in previous locations. Uh, other locations too, like Teotihuacan in Mexico, Uxmal and Mitla, which is in Oaxaca, they all show signs of not only construction during the time frame that archeologists talk about, but far more profound megalithic constructions. Usually the foundation work is megalithic. And then the, um, the cultures that we know about were responsible for building on top and around them. Now, Ushmal, for example, its original name means built three times. So that means in pre-Columbian times, uh, there were probably three different cultures responsible for building it. Of course, we have the Maya, but then the foundation work appears to have been done by some culture, again, with very advanced uh, technology of some kind, because the Maya and the Aztec and the Olmec did not have much, if anything, in the way of metal tools, not until yeah. the Spanish showed up. So we're looking at something very similar to what we just mentioned um, further to the south, that in that the Olmec, what we think of as the pre-Olmec, the pre-Aztec, the pre-Maya, it seemed there was a group here that was far different than a lot of the later groups that came along. And I get this all the time. I get messages from people all the time. If these cultures were so advanced, what were they doing with all those blood sacrifice practices and all this darkness they were doing? And I have to point out that well, those structures in a lot of those cultures are based on much older cultures that were originally there. I think that we're, we're looking at so many different time periods that we can't lump them all to the same one. We have to look at this on a lens of, well, who was originally here? Who originally built these structures? What cultures came later that found them? And what cultures maybe um, decided to take a different path, a different direction in terms of their focus and what they wanted to do. Some became very warlike and we have to acknowledge that, but not lumped in together in the same place. And I think a good example for that is a place like, like Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is a, a, a strange site that has some megalithic components in places like the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, but it looks like they mm -hmm. were almost stones that were reused by the culture that came there that had, took a part in building it. But even that culture, when you dig into it, we don't truly know who built that site originally. And it, to me, it points to the fact that in a lot of these sites, we find smaller remnants of those cultures that were originally there, perhaps because some of those other cultures utilize those stones in other ways. But it is there, right? You've done incredible video where you've gone to Ushmal and you've shown that, well, look, in some parts of this temple, we find much larger blocks than others, right? Yeah, that interlock again without mortar. And uh, again, we see uh, signs of uh, cataclysmic damage uh, to Teotihuacan. The, the temple of uh, Quetzalcoatl is very different in its original construction pattern as compared to the pyramid of the sun and the moon. Um, you know, very large blocks uh, and then built on top of using much smaller stones. So again, Mexico is much more subtle than what we see in Peru, but um, you know, I've been there many times and each, each time I go, I see more examples. The finest example of megalithic work in Mexico is at Mitla. There you find these massive beams yeah. weighing six tons, 10 tons, up to 20 tons that are put on, on top of inferior construction work. And so that again is the recycling of massive megalithic works incorporating them into uh, much less um, profound work. And of course, the, the, I think the biggest one that to mention of all, if you're going to talk about something like a pre-Aztec, would be the monolith of Tlaloc. Maybe just mention oh. something briefly about the monolith of Tlaloc, because that may be like the best megalithic evidence in Mexico or one of the best pieces. Yeah, it's, it's a huge humanoid figure or human figure. Uh, right now, it's located at the Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology in Mexico City. It was found in a, a little town outside of Mexico City, lying um, on its back, and it weighs a minimum of 100 tons. It was moved with great difficulty in the 1960s from its original location to the museum, but it's, um, it's probably the largest 
um, ancient single stone humanoid figure ever made in the Americas, as far as I can tell. And Tlaloc was the rain god. Yeah. Just to, to let people know. Yeah. Now, I have a theory, Brian, on why I think there's not more megalithic evidence in especially places like the Maya realm, but even, even into parts of the Aztec. I'm, I know that the Aztec region had access to some harder stones, a lot of volcanic material, but it feels like if you, if you, you, know, if you go over visit to a lot of the Mayan sites like Uxmal and up towards Chichen Itza, you're looking at a limestone bedrock underneath that would be one of the softest um, erodible materials possible. Have you thought about the theory that maybe they used materials to build some of those original structures um, out of some of those? And then maybe these cataclysms in time just didn't allow for a lot of that to survive? Well, it could be. Uh, our geologist, Susan Moore, um, has told me she's been on lots of these locations with us. And she said that a lot of the limestone that is located in that part of Mexico is actually much harder than standard limestone that we find in quarries today. So because it was formed uh, in the bottom of the ocean and over the course of millions of years was uplifted, that caused a lot of compression of the fine particles and made the stone a lot harder than what most people associate with, with modern day limestone, which is modern limestone is soft enough that you can easily uh, scrape with a a standard uh, steel knife, but this harder material is um, would be very difficult to shape uh, given the limited technology that people like the Olmec and the Maya had. Yeah. So, so clearly we, we see that both um, North and South America contain extensive megalithic lost civilization evidence that has very, very strong evidence that, ha that shows that it was connected somehow to places like maybe um, Egypt, maybe Turkey, maybe the Mediterranean. That's, so that's where we're going to move next. So the next place, we're going to go across the Atlantic Ocean. We're going to start in Menorca, Spain, and just briefly mention that there's some really incredible large pillars there that have some similarities almost to Gobekli Tepe, I would say in a way, Brian. Yeah, there are a lot of T-shaped pillars that look very similar to those found at Gobekli Tepe. Uh, Gobekli Tepe has now been shown to be minimum 11,500 years old, so about twice as old as, as civilization as we know it. Uh, the little on-site museum has this propaganda display saying that Gobekli Tepe was constructed by hunter-gatherers, which is really ridiculous because it would take a lot of coordination to be able to cut these uh, giant T-shapes that weigh up to 20 tons from the bedrock itself and be able to transport them, not that great a distance, but still transport them. That takes a lot of coordinated activity. So that site by itself, uh, as shown by radiocarbon testing, is about twice as old as any civilization that we recognize today. And that's the great... Um, mystery and, and great charm of Gobekli Tepe. The, uh, the tool marks, you can see the actual tool marks in the stone itself. Uh, so not sophisticated, but just the, the fact that it's so old and the fact that these um, pillars are, are pretty big means a very coordinated society, not a bunch of hunter or a number of hunter gatherers showing up once a year for three months to do this kind of work. Yeah. No, it doesn't make any sense. Actually, in, when when they investigated those soil layers in Gobekli Tepe, they found that there were hunter-gatherer evidence on some of the lower layers, but then all of a sudden, a layer right above it showed all this advancement with agriculture and a sophisticated society that seemed to come out of nowhere. So I think Gobekli Tepe is a great example where if they study that further, because they've only uncovered something like, what, 20 or 30% of the entire site today, if they're able to investigate- oh, I think at least no, I think like, yeah, no, I think it's about 5%. Okay. Gobekli so it's Tepe is, is yeah. huge. They've only, oh yeah, they've only uncovered one circle, but there's supposedly 30 or 40 of these massive stone circles. And for some reason, the Turkish government doesn't want to continue excavating. It's strange. what huh? we come up with time after time when, so, yeah, when there's a mysterious site that's found you know, the, the government automatically adopts it as its crown jewel. But then when you say there's obvious evidence that it's much bigger, they say, well, 
we're not planning on doing any more excavating. It's like, yeah, come on. We don't need to know anything else. Right. We have, we have what we need. 5% is enough to, to understand. Yeah. Right? yeah um, but what fascinates yeah, we solved it. What fascinates me the most, I guess, Brian, about Menorca, Spain and Quebec Tepe are these very similar giant T-shaped pillars that seem to be organized in almost like an astronomical temple. And I think it just shows us that those cultures, at least the same type of focus or what the reasoning behind why they made those and the fact that Quebec Tepe has the age that it has been radiocarbon dated just shows that see, these are likely part of those mm -hmm. more ancient cultures. Now, maybe they didn't build the, the Cusco type of structures, but it doesn't, it means that their focus was a, for a different reason. When, and I think that's the, that's what we have to look at the, the lens when we really view all these different places is that, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of these are much, much older than we're told, but we, we can't look for just one telltale sign to tell us that it's older. There's a lot of different uh, things that we should be looking for. Like for instance, just looking for giant stones alone that are carved for, for specific reasons would be a good way, a good starting point because you would have the challenges of how would that culture have moved those stones? Why would they have done it? And so those, that brings up the needy questions to say, okay, so this is probably part of a, a different place. Which leads me, Brian, to the next site in the Mediterranean that's next to it that you're actually going to visit on one of your tours coming up, which is Malta and the, and the Hippogeum with some of these elongated skulls that have come out there. Maybe just briefly mention a couple of things about that. Okay, well, there have been at least, I think, 2,000 elongated skulls that have been found on Malta. They're not on public display at this time. We're hoping to get access to them in September. Uh, they don't have the sagittal suture, which we have in our skulls, similar to some of the ancient elongated skulls found in especially Peru. Uh, then there's also the hypogeum, which is only one megalithic structure of many. Uh, we have a private um, viewing of the hypogeum when we go there in September. So that'll be great. I've never been. It's one of those little gems located in the Mediterranean that I've wanted to visit and finally get to, but there are, I think we're spending five days there. So we'll be able to see the ancient uh, cart tracks that have been carved into the bedrock and all sorts of, of ancient things. So I'm very excited about Malta. Yeah. And so Malta is a great example of what I was just talking about a second ago, where we can't look for just one type of design or, or signature structure of these lost civilizations. They seem to have all different reasons for why they did it. For instance, the Hippogeum in Malta is, is a subterranean type of structure carved out of solid rock that had a very different function, it seems like, right? Yeah, it seems to have incredible acoustics, which we'll be able to find out about. And that's, um, that's also something that we, we find in other ancient megalithic locations too, where Acoustics seem to be inherent in the construction and also in the function of these ancient places. Uh, so uh, you get resonance, uh, you, you know, you get cavities cut into the bedrock that will respond to one specific tone, such as in the um, in the king's chamber in Egypt is you know it's a classic example of that. But many other locations where you have this vibratory um, kind of feature about these ancient places and that's probably also why you have the construction where the stones fit so tightly together it's so that the whole structure will vibrate as if it's one stone um, and naturally would then be earthquake proof yeah so those are the kinds of questions that lead to answers because when you figure out that ah well this is they built them in this way for this reason to have these types of acoustic properties that had to have been one of the the purposes behind them I, and i feel like that's how we're going to find answers is to really dig into those types of aspects now we're going to move on brian just to the the northeast and the here's a couple areas that i feel like has been have also been lumped together with the same cultures that we're told but also have evidence for being shown are much older. And I want to just mention those two, which in places in, uh, in Italy and places in Greece, right? We, we, we do see that remnant, like Plato says, where maybe the Titans and the Olympians were real and they're part of a much, much older culture in the area. Yeah, that's a good point. Especially the Western side of Italy, you, you have massive megalithic constructions um, 
that uh, don't appear to have been done by the standard cultures that we think of in the area. You know, staircases going up out of one giant block of stone or an outcrop of stone. And then in Greece, there are different locations. Uh, the, what the Acropolis is built on in Athens appears to be a giant megalithic foundation. So, um, so there are clear indications that there was at least one very advanced civilization prior to the time of the Romans and possibly into what we call, uh, you know, the ancient um, Titans or what a, whatever other culture you want to ascribe to them. So, yeah, I think definitely. And, and they all seem to have mysteriously disappeared out of nowhere without a trace. I mean, it, it baffles me as we, and we're not there yet, but just to go a little ahead, in places like Baalbek, Lebanon, with the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, and then, and then go all the thousands of miles away, get down into Africa, get down into Egypt and Aswan, and the unfinished obelisk, and a lot of these other places, it seems that the construction, they had reached the peak of, of how advanced they were, and they were in the middle of creating all of these incredible things that would have been the largest of their time, or nearly the largest, but then poof, mysteriously, the, all the work stops and they just disappear, right? Yeah, that's the important thing is that almost all of these locations, especially in Egypt and uh, Baalbek and Petra, etc., that it appears suddenly one day the workers dropped their tools and departed. Uh, you know, you see so many things that are unfinished. The unfinished obelisk is the most obvious uh, example in the Aswan area weighing up to 1,200 tons was not completed. Something suddenly caused the work to stop. And that's the great mystery. We, of course, believe it was a some kind of cataclysm that happened in pre-dynastic times. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and older and older the more we look. And so that's the next place to go along this list of, of, of cataloging all of these would be uh, Israel to start, I guess, getting into the Middle East a little bit. You've actually seen some megalithic evidence in the Wailing Wall. Is that right? Yeah, I, we were supposed to go to um, to Israel last March, and we couldn't go because Israel locked its borders, uh, which was very sad. But there's a tunnel underneath uh, Temple Mount that has blocks, at least one, if not many, that are between 500 and 600 tons apiece. And how they could have possibly been put into place, again, is an incredible mystery, because that would require the nature of at least 5,000 very strong people to be able to move on a, verti on a horizontal surface, something that size. Um, so that's why I'm still hoping to go one of these days. There could be other examples of megalithic work in, um, in Israel, but the most obvious one are these stones located in a tunnel underneath or very close to the, to the Wailing Wall. Yeah. Now, it's just another one of those examples of a location that we think everything was built at this certain time period, but then there's these remnants that this, these artifacts or these stones that just don't fit in. They, they seem to be part of a completely different time and where some of them were recycled, some of them were used in different ways, but the telltale evidence of that is still there. Didn't, wasn't, am I correct in that you guys had actually identified on one of your trips to the Wailing Wall or at least Israel, some Aswan pink granite? Um, not in Israel, as far as I know, but uh, we found examples of Aswan granite at like 300 columns at Baalbek in Lebanon, um, you know, different locations in Italy. There are massive pillars out of one piece of Aswan granite, as well as obelisks that were taken from Egypt. Um, so, yeah, you, you find, you know, inside the Vatican Museum, there are things that don't fit yeah, in the proper course. timeline. So it's, uh, yeah, the more locations you go to and the more times you go to these locations, the more you discover these anomalies that don't fit in with what standard academia is trying to tell us. So you just said that there's Aswan granite that's been identified by some of the geologists you've worked with that has been found in places over 500,000 miles away in other parts of the world, especially around in the Middle East and around the Mediterranean. Would that then maybe provide some evidence to show that the earlier commissions, the earlier Egyptians that came before the dynastic pharaohs, perhaps 
that was one of the most important players in this entire mix. If they were, if they were the ones providing some of these important stones. Yeah. Well, the Canetians are described as a pre-dynastic civilization that lived in, in Egypt. Um, some people ascribe them with the capabilities, like the superhuman capabilities. Uh, we honestly don't know if the Canetians actually existed because they've left no skeletons or anything like that. Just these massive, intricate works in stone. So, you know, we don't really know who the pre-dynastics were, but we do know they had capabilities of <clears throat> working with stone in some ways beyond our capability today. There are just so many locations in Egypt that are, are profoundly complicated <clears throat> excuse me, and, and mind boggling that, you know, that would take two, it would take two hours to pot, to properly talk about Egypt at yeah, all. Of course. And, and we're going to get to Egypt in just a second here. Uh, but as we continue near Israel, I just want to first bring up the fact that in that area, we, we do find some very strange um, structures that seem to be built out of giant doorways. And I, I just want to mention, have you maybe just briefly talk about Petra Jordan and how that seems to be a very unusual site that is going to share some similarities with other places like, like in Saudi Arabia that we're going to talk about in a second. Yeah, you bet. I hadn't done much research about Petra before I went, which is strange for me, <clears throat> but there's an area called the Seek, which is the opening. It's like a, a walkway through this cavern that goes to where the uh, major site is. And that by itself is a mile long. I thought it was gonna be like two or 300 feet. But when we were halfway through, I asked our guide, how far does Petra go? And he said seven miles or 12 kilometers. So uh, what most people think about Petra is what's called the treasury, which was in Indiana Jones. But the treasury is one about 1% one maximum 5% of what Petra is. It's a huge location that keeps like going and going and going. You see the presence of a culture called the Nabataeans who were an Arabic people who were there. Uh, and then later you have the Romans who were there, but both found a massive megalithic construction out of solid, very hard sandstone material. There are chambers at Petra that are 300,000 cubic feet in size. And so it's, you know, we, we had to walk all the way to the end and back because it's just so shockingly huge and complicated. And we saw machine marks all over the place, not just simply tool marks, but clear evidence of three different kinds of machining marks. And then the blackening of the Western surfaces uh, and vitrification or melting of the surface of the stone. So that again, likely shows us that Petra was hammered by a massive, um, some kind of uh, cataclysm, possibly uh, an EMP from the sun or something like that in the very, very distant past was left abandoned for a very long time and then was later found by these people we call the Nabataeans who were, you know, they were not a sophisticated technological culture, but they occupied the site. Exactly. And going along those lines of cataclysms and stopping work abruptly and these incredible um, structures that have been created that seem to have been built with technology we don't even understand today. I want you to briefly talk about, even though we could probably talk about this one next place, I, I would even go as far to say that it's the largest, right? The, the next place I'm about to mention is probably the largest megalithic evidence of stones ever carved in the world. So if you were to pick a place that you get to hang your hat and say, this is, this is the largest of any megalithic blocks in the world. You would probably have to argue that it was, it would be in the Baalbek Lebanon complex, right? Oh, definitely. Baalbek, you know, is, is again, very astonishing. You have the, the location of Baalbek it's, itself, which, you know, again, was occupied by the Romans who did some work. And then in the middle ages, it was turned into a fortress. Uh, but you have one block there, which now has been fully excavated called this is they call it the, the stone of the pregnant woman, but that's a misinterpretation of the translation. It's actually the foundation stone and it's been measured at 1200 tons. And then we, it's still attached to the bedrock. And then right next to it, they just un, uncovered another block, which is deeper into the earth attached to the bedrock. And it's 1,600 tons. 
And then in the location of Baalbek itself, which is about a mile away, uh, you have three blocks called the Trilithon, which are a thousand tons apiece, and then two major walls made up of stones that weigh between 600 and 800 tons. Uh, you also have a lot of patina, which is discolored or discoloration of the surfaces. So that shows the great antiquity of this lower level of construction. Then on top of that, you have reconstruction done by the Romans. And on top of that, in the Middle Ages, you have it turned into a fortress, uh, I think, to fend off, uh, you know, the European who were crusaders who were probably moving around at that time. So it's, um, yeah, it's a mind-blowing location, like so, all of these are. I mean, conventional history is going to tell us that the Romans are the ones who constructed that, but we know for a fact that it would have been impossible for them to, to work and, and move those blocks that size, right? Yeah, 1,200 tons. Again, uh, that stone was never finished, so something suddenly stopped the work. And how would, you, how would you possibly move something of that size, even if you were able to? It's not a, a flat area, <clears throat> just like in the highlands of Peru. It's very rolling and mountainous. So you're not going to be cutting down a bunch of you know, trees. So the, the trees that grow in the area are pretty small. So you wouldn't have uh, trees big enough to be able to use as rollers. And you wouldn't have had the manpower to be able to move something of that scale. So clearly, this is something from... The pre-Roman times that was discovered, the Romans adopted it, and they did less high-quality craftsmanship on top. Absolutely. It seems so clear to me. And there's there's a number of other locations around there as well to mention. There's almost too many. So we're just, I, for those that are going to yell at me, you didn't mention this site or this site, we're going to hit the major ones because we would be here all day if we were trying to talk about all of them. And the next major yeah. site that's nearby, before we move into Africa, I want you to just briefly talk about Turkey because to me, Turkey has some of the greatest mysteries of all the megalithic sites in the world. You have everything from um, core drill holes to giant pillars and gates and underground cities. And I mean, it just goes on and on. Just mention a few areas of, in Turkey that are of megalithic uh, interest. Sure. Well, Turkey, uh, Turkey is, uh, is amazing. There are megalithic sites all over Turkey. Uh, Hattusha is one that uh, shows lots of core drill holes and also construction out of granite that was brought from <coughs> uh, a quarry at least 200 miles away. So that was a great surprise. Then you have the underground cities of which there are 200 to 400 of them, supposedly interconnected with subterranean tunnels. Hattusha goes down a minimum of 20 stories, but it could be much deeper. We were allowed about 10 stories underground. They say it had a population of 20,000 people, but you can, you know, no two people can walk side by side down through this complex. It has to be one person at a time. Uh, the surfaces of the walls are very, very uh, fine, seem very finely polished. So the idea that this was all done using hand tools is ridiculous. So it's another example of something or a group of places that were found by cultures that we know of and utilized, but they ne there's no way they did the original construction. Uh, there's also a place called the Titus Tunnel, which was cut into bedrock. It's a, a tunnel that goes on for about a mile. It's like 30 feet tall. Um, <clears throat> lots of places in, in Turkey. Uh, the museum in Istanbul has some incredible examples of huge boxes made out of rhyolite stone, which is super hard. Comes from one location in Egypt. Um, so yeah, Turkey. You know, I've been to Turkey once. I'd love to go back another time. But it's uh, it's got amazing stuff all over the place. That's and that's a perfect segue into into Africa, specifically Egypt, because so we find blocks of travertine in in Egypt in some of these ancient sites that seems to have come from Turkey. And then in Turkey, we find some types of granite that seems to be, have come from Egypt. So, and, and when you look at the advancements of those two cultures and the similarities, it seems to me that those two cultures had to have been closely connected in, in some way, which is why we're going to discuss some of these incredible Egyptian sites as well. Because to me, Egypt 
is another one of these places you could spend your entire life um, investigating. But the first one we're going to mention is not one that most people probably really know about, and that is Axum, Ethiopia, right, Brian? Oh, you bet. There's Axum in Ethiopia <clears throat> and also another site called Lalibela. And um, Axum is where you have these churches that are now churches that were cut into the bedrock, like massive in scale. Um, and then in Lalibela, you have what's left of some massive uh, columns that look kind of like obelisks made out of, carved out of granite that again, could not have been done by the cultures attributed to them. So that's, uh, that's one country I haven't been to. Supposedly it's very difficult to move around Ethiopia very efficiently, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those side examples of, of something that uh, fits in with uh, a lot of these other mysterious places that we've been discussing so far, like very enigmatic, not uh, possible to ascribe them to the standard cultures that uh, academics talk about. Yeah, and Ethiopia certainly has a lot more investigation needed. Some of the obelisks that are in Ethiopia have been estimated to be over 100 tons. So another incredible place that really needs to have more looked into it. So that really leads us into um, really the heart of the, uh, the African megalithic structures, which is, I want you just to mention some of them. I'm going to just briefly go through a list of some of the ones we talked about, and you can discuss some of them, such as um, a lot of the different features around the Great Pyramids of Giza, um, the Colossi of, Colossi of Memnon, some of these core drill holes in Abu Sir, the Valley Temple near the Great Sphinx, the Osirion in Abydos, Temple of Seti, the Serapium with the giant stone boxes, um, and then, of course, in an Elephantine Island um, in Aswan. Uh, just briefly mention some of those sites and some of the significance, the, uh, significant megalithic structures and other technological features we find in those. Okay, when, when people think about Giza in Egypt, they think about three big pyramids, which is, of course, true. But Giza, uh, the Giza Plateau is, is massive in scale. It goes on and on and on to sites like Saqqara, Abu Sir, Abu Rawash, Abu Ghraib, and at all of those locations we see examples of machining technology, uh, huge constructions, cataclysmic damage. Abu Sir has more drill, ancient drill holes than probably any other location, and no, they're not modern drill holes because yeah. the nearest electrical plug is probably a mile away. <laughs> um, there are other uh, amazing locations. Probably the farthest north one is Tanis or Tanis, which is in the Nile Delta. Um, it was a huge construction. It, at one time, it had something like 13 obelisks. Everything there is shattered into pieces. Um, for the archaeologists to find anything there, they had to actually dig. Nothing was on the surface. So everything was buried by some kind of event underground. Uh, there are, I think, six plants that grow in about a 500 acre area. So the, the ground itself is like walking on the moon. It's like powdered flour. Uh, there is no nutrient left in that soil. Meanwhile, it's just a little hill surrounded by miles and miles and miles of, of very fertile farmland. So it's a very great anomaly. Uh, most of the greatest megalithic stuff is found around the Giza area. Uh, again, Giza is very big. Um, and then the farther south would be Aswan, where you have the unfinished obelisk. That, that's the quarry where almost all of the ancient granite was taken from, including the interior of the Great Pyramid and other pyramids. So you're talking about transportation hundreds upon hundreds of hundreds of miles from the quarry itself to these locations. And there is no sign that there were any forests of trees um, in ancient times located there to be able to build barges out of. So the major question is, how did you shape the stone? How did you release it from the bedrock? How did you transport it? How did you, you know, fit these things into place? So again, Egypt, you know, is possibly the most um, curious um, and strange ancient location on, on the planet. It seems to be the heart of whatever this or at least one of the hearts of whatever this, the, 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 I guess you could call it 
the most powerful side of whatever these lost civilizations are. Egypt is a major player in that. It seemed to play a big part in whatever this mysterious past we have is. And I just wanted you to mention a couple of the anomalies around just, I guess, the Great Pyramids of Giza, because of so many people, has so much interest in it. Discuss just briefly, Brian, how we seem to have this limestone outer insulated part of these structures. But within them, for instance, in the Great Pyramid above the King's Chamber, we have these massive, beautifully carved megalithic blocks that they would have ha- would have been very difficult to get into there in the first place, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the, you know, you could talk for an hour about the Great Pyramid by itself if not longer, because you have between 2.3 and 2.5 million multi-ton blocks that were somehow cut from the quarry, moved to the location and interlocked over the course supposedly of 25 years. Uh, There is also evidence that some of the limestone quarries that were utilized were on the other side of the Nile. So how would you transport, you know, it's it's an impossibility. that it could have been done during dynastic times. And it, it's, you know, it's so complex. Uh, so, you know, 500 feet tall, it, even from 10 miles away, it towers above the landscape of the Giza area. Uh, and, you know, as you mentioned, the Serapium at Saqqara, where you have at least 28, if not more, huge uh, boxes, some weighing up to 100 tons in, in a, these two subterranean passages, supposedly, it goes on much, much farther. And that's the great thing about Egypt is that each time I go, more and more of it is opened up to the public by special permission. You have the Osiris shaft, which is a shaft that goes down into the bedrock at Giza of more than 200 feet, uh, probably interconnects with a tunnel system that exists. Uh, Even standard um, Egyptologists say that only 15% of ancient Egypt has been unearthed. And that's because 85% of it was built on purpose underground. Then under the step pyramid, you have a massive complex in the bedrock itself that we had access to a year ago, you know, which has only been open to the public for, I think six, no, about a year. Uh, Then the Osirion, which is now open to the public. That's located at Abydos. It's a, a big complex built on purpose underground. I got access to it for half an hour by myself last March, and it is huge in scale. It just keeps going. You go down, and it just keeps going and going and going. It's a huge hallway that goes on for hundreds of feet. Um, Amazing. What, there's just so much in Egypt. This it's, is almost you know, like too much to talk country. about, right? Well, and more being opened up as we go. So, you know, we're going in October, so probably we'll get access to places that we were not given access to before. Uh, more and more of these giant boxes are being found that weigh 50 to 100 tons that people call sarcophagi, but were made out of very hard stone that could not have been done by the dynastic people. Some of them could have been used as sarcophagi, but they weren't made as sarcophagi. They were made for something else. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to mention uh, two more as well, just to conclude the Giza area, because there's just so much to talk about. But to me, some of the finest work that I've ever seen looks like it's on the Valley Temple near the Sphinx enclosure, just outside of it. But in both the Sphinx with the water erosion marks that are around the Sphinx enclosure and the sophistication seen at the Valley Temple alone show you that those structures and those places built were clearly part of this much, much older time period when Egypt was not only just what you see above, but below as well, this incredibly complex, probably the most complex underground labyrinth besides Turkey in the world, where it seems to have this huge focus on aquifers and energy and, and going underneath in the subterranean areas of the planet that play, played a vital role in the functionality of what those structures were built for. Uh, but there's just so much more to, to look at with Egypt. And, I've, and Egypt alone is going to, to me, Egypt alone has so much evidence for the, this lost history that you could even ignore all the other sites in the world and have enough there just to prove that there were lost civilizations. But it's just another player in all of these places that have these, these similarities and this similar type of style and types of technologies they had available to them and the types of knowledge that they knew, which moves us on to the next region 
which is very close to this area of Giza, just east of it, in the most war-torn place of our generations that has just seems like it's a never-ending cycle of where some of these powerful individuals just want to continue instability and not allow anybody in. Now, those just want to preface on those who don't know my work at all, and maybe you're really familiar with Brian. I spend a considerable amount of my time in the Middle East in places like Iraq and Iran, looking at not only the cuneiform tablets and the ancient texts that have come out of those, those areas, but some of the megalithic evidence that exists in those places as well. And I'm just going to briefly talk about this region um, I did a, a show back on the in the new year talking about that just to, just to start is discussing how a lot of these sites have been destroyed. They're no longer available to us and they're gone. Places like Palmyra, Syria, that have, like Brian mentioned, in a lot of other places of the world, a base similar to around Athens in Greece, where it seems like the base has a megalithic component. And then there's other structures that were built on top of that later columns and these pillars that have almost like a Roman, uh, a Greek type of style, but that, that base is megalithic in Syria. And it's one of the most war-torn places in the world that's been systematically destroyed by these organized terrorist groups. And next, right next to it, um, there's a couple I want to mention in Iraq. Now, Iraq, the importance of Iraq is for other reasons besides what we're talking about today. Like I mentioned, the cuneiform tablets that come out of there and a lot of the ancient history that is recorded in those. But there is a megalithic site in Iraq, and I don't think most people even have ever heard of it or know about it. And I've talked about it years ago in some of my earlier work, but there's a place called Kinnis Rock outside of Jerwan that has have these massive rock reliefs, hundreds of feet tall, carved out of these sheer cliffs that we're going to get into some of those other similarities in other places as well. But these places that would have been in. Uh, inaccessible and how could they have created these massive rock reliefs out of this tough stone so kinnis rock is an, an, a relief that shows these two assyrian gods that have earlier sumerian names of assur and melissu and you can look in and find that assur may have had some connections with possibly the earliest sumerian connections of enlil and melissu was his consort and those were the names that were used during that time and right next to um, the Kinnis Rock, this massive relief, we find this site of this aqua ancient aqueduct system of Jerwan with the largest cuneiform writing in the world. You find cuneiform the same style everywhere except this one location where you have uh, cuneiform writing that's literally three, four times larger than anywhere. Seems to be written for giants, if anything. Um, and right next to Iraq, is perhaps the, one of the greatest of all of the uh, megalithic evidence to me in the Middle East, and that's Iran. Another one of these, one of these war-torn regions that seems to be off limits to anyone really visiting and exploring. And yet some of the sites like Persepolis with this very strange individual known, known as Darius I and other lo locations like Nashe, Rostam, and Behistun inscription, some of the most incredible megalithic structures. Nashe Rostam alone is what to me, outside of places like Petra Jordan, is one of the greatest rock, rock reliefs carved out of, a, out of a mountainside I've ever seen before. These gigantic um, cross-like doorways carved into, into mountainsides. Who built them? When were they built? Who built them? We don't find that information in, in, in many writings. We find some Assyrian and cuneiform writing in, in somewhere like the Behistun inscription that talks about Darius and Ahura Mazda and some of these ancient kings and beings that may have been responsible. We really don't know what culture actually built them. And I just want to briefly mention that some, the, the Behistun inscription is another one of these rock reliefs with cuneiform writing written right into the actual stone itself that is 330 feet up on a sheer cliff. Just absolutely strange and mysterious how something like that could have been carved into sheer rock that high up on a sheer cliff. And it's, it's 82 feet wide, this, this relief known as the Behistun inscription. So Iran has all kinds of mysteries. And if we can get out of this war cycle maybe we can get in and actually start to see some of them but the one region i want to bring in brian brian to talk about that has been called in a lot of ancient cuneiform writings known as for instance enki in the world order th this region that is known as dil moon and it's the region of iran and saudi arabia so saudi arabia is the next place i want to move to where 
again, just like Petra Jordan, Nashe Rostan in Iran, these giant megalithic rock reliefs in carved out of sheer mountainsides. So Brian, just briefly talk about some of these places in Iran, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, maybe mention Madain Saleh and some, and a couple of the others. Yeah, well, Madain Saleh, you can look up, um, you know, on the internet, it's in the seemingly in the middle of nowhere. And, um, uh, the way that uh, these have been, these things have been sculpted out of the bedrock are eerily similar to what we see at Petra in Jordan. So I think they were done by the same ancient builders. Um, what happened, um, as we were discussing earlier, was that at Petra you had the um, you had a group of people who moved into that area around 200 BC and they became very wealthy merchants. They probably brought Greek sculptors in to do some fine detail work. But if you look at the, just the, the basic uh, vertical shapes that we find both at Petra and Little Petra, which is a location nearby, and also in Saudi Arabia, uh, you have again, flat surfaces, and then you have this kind of curved shape, and then you have what looks like a bullnose shape. And they look exactly Exactly the same in Saudi Arabia as in uh, Petra and Little Petra. So I think they were done by the same ancient builders at the same time. Um, luckily, now you're allowed to go into tourists allowed in Saudi Arabia now. Before it it was forbidden, but these sites are starting to open up to uh, to the world for exploration. And some someday I'd love to go and see them and document you know what they look like. Me too. It's it seems like it's on. Petra Jordan, Nashe Rostam in Iran, and this Madain Saleh in Saudi Arabia. These just giant rock reliefs, like beyond even what I could comprehend a group being able to create, just seemingly in the middle of nowhere, like you said, in these inhospitable places carved just out of sheer mountainsides. And it's not even just one. In some examples like Madain Saleh, there's just one after another. Some of them are just in these very singular rocks in the sitting on the desert where they just carved right out of it. And half of this rock is just some kind of an ancient doorway and others are sequentially found along these other um, stone mountains. But there's one more site. I just want to bring up also in Saudi Arabia that it's incredibly strange and maybe points towards some of this locked, lost technology. And that's El, uh, El Nesla rock, right, Brian? Yeah, I think that's located you know, in, in the same area, area, um, it looks like some kind of laser tool was used to cut this notch like straight through it. You know, so very, very mysterious location. Um, one of those ones that is definitely on my to-do list at, at some point in time, but it's a, it's a surreally um, efficient looking uh, workmanship of, of some kind, not something that could be done with hand tools. Um, so yeah, that's another curious place. It is so odd. It's these, just these giant rock that's been cut perfectly in half with, with like a laser like precision on a line down through it. And it's just left there sitting there for whatever purpose it was, it was done for just to show off that they can cut it in half or for just a completely other reason. We don't know. It's just sitting there and it's yet another one of these mysteries. And now, Brian, we're going to continue along our trek here because this is it's very extensive and this is a great discussion into these sites. But another place that's another very strange mystery that's, again, like all these others, has been lumped into the same time period is India in what's in part of what we what are called the Indus Valley civilizations. Now, in the tablet I mentioned, the ancient cuneiform tablet I, I mentioned that's called Enki in the World Order, that Del, the Del Moon region is mentioned as one of the groups, that, one of the regions that they are, had trading with and connections with those ain't the ancient part of Iraq. And the other reason they mentioned is a place called Maluha. And when you look into Maluha, the name Maluha references these, the India, Pakistan, Afghanistan region where these Indus Valley civilizations are. So maybe you could briefly mention and talk a little bit about some, some of these incredible places like Alora Caves and Elephanta Island and, and Barbar Hill Caves, just really amazing places, right? Yeah, all three of those locations are incredible because um, Barabar, it's a uh, Gr solid granite somehow somebody was able to cut 
into these mass, you know, chambers into these massive uh, bedrock stones. The surfaces are polished like glass. So how that was done, I have no idea. I haven't been able to get to India yet. We tried a couple of times, but uh, the two tours that we planned both failed, but Alora and Elephanta, again, massive complexes in, in those cases, basalt, where you have hallways carved into the bedrock itself going on hundreds and hundreds of feet, incredibly ornate. And I think in this case, what happened was these are very, very ancient constructions that again, ancient Indian people discovered and then they had the technology maybe around 700 AD or so to be able to sculpt uh, into this hard basalt stone and, and do like figurative stuff like humans and, and other Hindu based um, cultural images and things like that. But I think the original constructions themselves were done using very advanced kinds of, of technology. So that's uh, those, and there are many, many more locations like that. There's a guy called Praveen uh, Mohan who has a, a YouTube channel. He's based in India and he's produced hundreds and hundreds of incredible uh, videos of many locations all over India, as well as in Sri Lanka and other locations. So he's definitely a great resource to look up. Um, and someday I would love to go because there's some of the largest megalithic constructions ever done anywhere on the planet. Yeah. And I just want to mention probably the number one of all those of, that you mentioned. Bara Bara is amazing and Elephanta Island is amazing. But the one that to, to me really truly stands out is Alora Caves and Kalash Temple. You're talking about the single largest object ever carved out of a mountain, I believe, that temple at complex in there out of a single mountain. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it's just, you can't get a sense of, you know, you can get kind of a sense of scale by looking at pictures using, um, you know, humans as a, as a sense of scale, but you'd never understand the complexity of these places, I think, like anywhere, unless you go yourself and, and look at them. So I'm looking forward to that. At some, it's, you know, it's on the radar, but, but I don't know when, precisely I'll be able to go. We're, we will organize a tour at some point, but um, that's probably one of the crown jewels of locations that I haven't been to so far. Yeah. And it's just another one of these mysterious regions that needs a lot more investigation. And there's one more I want to mention before we move on to the next region as we go along here. And that one is one I talked about um, on one of the more recent shows that I've done, and that's the Bamiyan Valley of Afghanistan. And in the Bamiyan Valley of Afghanistan, you have two Buddha statues that was car carved out of a s massive rock relief. The first one of them is 185 feet tall, or I should say was, and the other was, was 125. And just like in Palmyra and a lot of other parts of the region, those were destroyed by these terrorist groups that went in and, and blew them up with dynamite. And we're just continuing to lose these incredibly in advanced sites around the world in these war-torn regions, and no one seems to really care. And so that's why I think it's important that we mention them and catalog them as part of this, because we're losing history all the time. And unless we can recognize it and investigate it, we're, we're not going to know what happened there because they're going to be destroyed and we're not going to have enough less to, left to look at. So it's important to we mention that. And so moving on behind, behind, beyond the Indus Valley civilizations, I just want to mention a couple before we get to China. And just very, very briefly, for those who have looked in into Southeast Asia, it's another very mysterious region, just like a lot of these other ones, where it's almost like something out of an Indian Jones movie where you have these temples in the middle of these jungles that no one knows who built them or when they were built. And it, conventional history is, is really not telling us the full story. Angkor Wat in Malaysia is just another one of these really mysterious sites with strange carvings that, that who knows what they were really trying to show. Um, but it's similar in a way to like the Temple of Seti, where it's just these I interesting imagery that go back to times when, you know, what are they really trying to show with that imagery? Is that really what was around during that time period? Um, but it, Angkor Wat certainly needs a lot more explanation. That's a, that's a massive complex that you could spend a lifetime exploring um, in, in, in Malaysia. And that's one you can get to um, that is definitely on my list. And the other one I want to mention is in Java and it's called Borobudur. 
Now, Borobudur is very unknown to a lot of the community that looks into and studies this, but it's another one of these very strange temples that seems to, no one really knows who built it. It's very similar to the Indus Valley civilizations where this incredible structure is just left there and no one really knows who built it and where it came from. But in Borobudur, there are what's in, what I find kind of fascinating about Borobudur is there are nine different levels in Borobudur on this incredible temple. Okay. And you go to across the world, the other end of the entire world, you're in Chichen Itza and you're in a place like Kukul Khan's temple. And that is nine levels as well. And those nine levels are supposed to represent the nine levels of consciousness. So when I see similarities like that in completely different parts of the world, I'm fascinated by whether or not at least that knowledge was being shared. And that's one of the reasons why perhaps they constructed in the first place. But in Borobudur's example, I want to just mention that there are 504 intricately carved Buddha statues in there that the precision on that temple is just mind blowing. And it's just yet again, one of these mysterious sites we can add to the list that needs more explanation. Now, Brian, we just have a couple left that we can talk about before we wrap up here, but I just want to, you to briefly mention one site in China that's incredibly mysterious, and I'm sure, sure there are others, but this site is known as Yangshan Quarry. Just, just talk a little bit about that for a second. Yeah, that, it, that, quarry, that could be the largest ancient quarry on the planet. There are huge blocks still attached to the bedrock um, on a massive scale, massive scale, quite possibly larger than... Um, Baalbek. In Baalbek in Lebanon. And there's very, you know, people visit the place, obviously, but it's, uh, it's not something that's been written about too much. And it's uh, incredibly mysterious, just its sense of scale. I believe the stone there, again, is, is basalt, so a very hard material. Um, China is one of those countries that has all sorts of uh, mysterious things that are not, I, are not, well documented on an international level. There are probably a lot of researchers in China who are looking at them. But, uh, you know, of course, there are also the so-called pyramids that are in China that um, have a dubious or likely unknown timeline and uh, other artifacts that uh, it, it appears are kind of inconvenient to um, some aspects of the present uh, society of China, I, I guess I would say. Yeah. And I want to just briefly mention also in Yangsheng Quarry, not only do you have those blocks that are almost beyond comprehension is the best way I would describe it, where you see a person standing on top of them, they look, almost look like an ant. I mean, we're talking about something that we really need to get to the bottom of these types of places like Baalbek and Yangshan, because it truly is um, mind blowing to even think that we probably can't do what they're doing then we would have an extreme level of difficulty achieving that in Yang Shen. I want to just mention there are areas besides the quarry or around the quarry. There are reliefs that look very similar in a way to me that remind me of something like in, uh, in Alora caves or Elephanta Island or Barbar Bar Hill in India, where there are cut, reliefs cut straight out of the rock in very, very precise ways, these cavities carved out. And there's even knobs in some of those walls near them that it's just make you ask more questions that how could knobs be present in China and also be present in places like Peru. And then we find knobs in Egypt, this acoustic type of property being used clearly shows that these have to be the same influences all over the world, whether or not it was one global megalithic lost civilization, all connected, or they were all connected through similar influences. It, it matters, but it almost doesn't matter because we at least know that those influences had to have been shared. And next to China is one of the most, to me, impressive of all places that needs, like I feel like I've already said that a bunch of times, but truly the next region we're about to move to as we wrap up here, our world tour, is Japan, an incredibly mysterious place. And I've gone through and actually really tried to find and look at all these different, they call them castles or temples in Japan, but it looks like the, the base of these temples has some of the most ma massive and precise blocks of anywhere in the world. Some of the finest work right up there with Egypt and Peru. So Brian, just briefly mention a couple of these incredible sites in Japan. 
Well, two of them would be uh, in Kyoto and then also the Imperial Palace in, uh, in Tokyo. Again, ascribed to being done by the Japanese at a certain date, but there are clearly megalithic, astonishing uh, scale of stones that almost you know, fit together perfectly. In some cases, possibly interlocked. These are the foundations of these structures. <clears throat> and they, they can't be explained by the technology that was at the time ascribed by the standard society. So very mysterious, but visually it's easy to look these up. If you just look up the Imperial Palace in Tokyo on the internet, you'll see photographs and you'll see just a sense of scale and the fact that the construction on top is inferior to the, the foundation work. So I mean, I've been to Japan, I think I actually was at the Imperial Palace at one point, but I was 17 at the time. So I, I was not interested whatsoever in this stuff at that time. But if I ever went back, then uh, yeah, Japan's another jewel. There's also Yonaguni Island, which is off of Japan. And it has what some believe are underground uh, or underwater surfaces that have been shaped by tools of some yeah. kind. Some geologists say, no, it's natural. Some people say, no, it's not. Uh, some of the surfaces appear to be perfectly um, flat and, and level on the horizontal aspect. So I guess the, um, the jury's out on, on that, but obviously an enigmatic place that's well worth uh, exploring by those who are strong enough to swim <laughs> in very, <clears throat> very difficult situation on the coast of Japan. Yeah, absolutely. And now I've done quite a bit of research into Japan. I think it's one of those future places that really is going to have to have a lot of investigation. And I want to just mention all the sites that I've, and some of that Brian just mentioned as well, but the list of, of at least what I've identified as megalithic components, part of a lost chapter in Japan, because it's just another neat place. Um, Osaka castle in the Imperial palace of Tokyo, um, Himeji castle, um, Fushimi, Nogoya Castle, Matsumoto, Moyomama. There's there's so many in that in that area. It's almost too many to mention, but those all need investigation with part of this lost chapter in China. Now, Brian, we just have one left left on the list before we finish our world tour here. It, and it's one of those places where we really just don't fully know whether or not it's similar. You mentioned off of the coast of Japan, where is this a natural structure or is this yet another example of some ancient wall that existed? And that's in New Zealand with the Kamenawa wall. Can you just, just talk a little bit about that before we wrap up? Yeah, it's located at uh, near Lake Taupo. Um, and I had the opportunity to actually physically go there and see it about five years ago. Um, it looks like a natural outcrop, but it's in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It's off the main road by, I think about eight miles. You're driving through this forest on a very narrow dirt road. And uh, all of a sudden this outcrop appears on the left-hand side. Everything else is basically flat. And then you have this wall appear and disappear. It's only maybe a hundred to maybe a hundred feet long. Um, and on close inspection, the surfaces are very flat. Uh, again, some people think it's, it's natural and that the stone itself is just broken over the course of, of time. It's a very uh, earthquake prone area. So, you know, that could have been done by earthquakes breaking the stone up. But uh, recent excavations have been done there um, by private individuals. And they found that the foundation of it goes down much deeper than what was at the surface when I was there. So a very enigmatic place. I'm not sure if it's natural or not, but if nature did that work, nature did an incredible, uh, incredible job at making flat surfaces. Uh, the local Maori uh, native people uh, seem to state that, had not, that it has nothing to do with them. So it could be an indication. Uh, there are other mis mysteries in New Zealand as well. Uh, the very large hill forts that were made that, again, the, the Maori themselves claimed they were not responsible for, but found when they arrived there. There are stories about ancient, um, very light-skinned, uh, light-hair-colored people who were living in uh, those islands prior to the time of the Maori that eventually got interbred into with the Maori. Still, some people to this day have red hair, 
which is not of uh, European extraction. But uh, And finally, there's a lady there called Monica who had her DNA tested. Uh, she has, she's in her 70s, I think. She has red hair. Uh, she was taunted by other children when she was growing up because they were Maori with black hair and she had red hair. And it turns out that her DNA shows that she's something like 25 to 30% of Persian extraction. Wow. So that shows um, migration patterns that, again, standard academia don't discuss, but we do. Absolutely. No door is closed for us. And I just, just exactly. like the Cayman Owl Wall in New Zealand, something that we didn't mention that I'll mention, something like in Bosnia with the Pyramid of the Sun and the Moon, you know, are these places natural or are these structures that were created by a, a, a previous civilization? I think more investigation is needed. There's certainly some anomalies that are incredibly in interesting in both of those locations. But until we can actually open the door on all of this and, and allow this paradigm to be explored further. It's going to take individuals like us to have to go forward and look at all of these. So Brian, thank you so much for that world look um, and mapping all of these lost megalithic civilizations. Clearly to me and many, many others, there's a lost chapter or chapters in human history that seem to go back far older than we're told, is much more sophisticated than we're told, and had a lot different influences than we're told. It seems that the true, the most interesting aspects of our story are part of that, those lost chapters, really getting into everything from human origins to who influenced the creation of all of these structures. Who was Viracocha? Who was Osiris? Who was any of these ancient beings or gods that are mentioned by these cultures as being a major factor? We need to investigate more and get to the bottom of this because that's, I feel like that's our job as, as conscious human beings to be asking these difficult questions and to be looking for answers rather than allowing a very silly and antiquated version of our, of our past to rule us and guide us forward. So thank you so much, Brian. Before I let you go, please tell everybody where they can find you. Um, what's the easiest way to get in, get in touch with you for a tour? Just any, any, any information you want to share about some of your incredible work you've done. Okay, well, my website is www.hiddenincatours.com. Um, and uh, I have, I think, 1,750 uh, YouTube videos now located at my, on my YouTube uh, channel. I'm very fortunate to be working now with, um, with Matt and with some of the others, such as Ben, who I mentioned earlier, and also Jimmy and this new generation of researchers who are gonna carry this work uh, far into the future, I'm hoping to do tours with Matt uh, in the future. We're talking the possibility maybe of next year, so that'll be wonderful. So those are the best places to uh, see my work. Uh, Hidden Inca Tours, counter to its name, uh, about 3% of the website is dedicated to the tours. All the rest is free information, such as videos and photographs and everything like that so those those are the best places to uh to look me up awesome and i i absolutely can't wait to to work with you in a higher capacity in the future brian it's always an honor you are a wealth of knowledge that truly needs to be carried on and i think that's why this is so important that we're doing the work that we're doing so thank you so much for joining me today for those who want to find my work, you can find my work at my web, my author website, thestageoftime.com or my YouTube page at Matthew LaCroix. And I just want to say I appreciate everyone for taking the time to look at this important information and to help push this narrative forward. Thank you so much, Brian. Pleasure. Always, Matt.